欢迎大家参与今天这个会议，我们今天这个会议呢，是我们Farmer uh,现在呢,今天的这个活动呢,我们会有那个,呃,提问的方案,就是打个比方,如果你在这个会议当中有一些问题需要提问的话呢,可以用我们下面的这个平台里头,我们有一个ask Wishing号,就是可以利用这个平台呢,也可以提问一些问题的。我们下一步呢,其实我们这个活动呢,今天这个会议呢,我们会有很多个关于Lonsmoothing 情况他们的结果大概是怎么样他们现在去找他们的合作临床的合作伙伴他们需要的我们邀请的是我们的分析师 大概要多长 So this is the time for you, Daniel. Please take it over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annie. Um, hello, everyone, and yes. welcome to today's session on the latest in immuno-oncology and a deep dive into non-small cell lung cancer. My name is Daniel Chancellor, and I'm a principal analyst within Pharma Intelligence, and I'm also joined by my colleague, Andrew Benson, a senior director at Charles Trove. Today, our presentation will take you through a background to IO and its drug classes, then using the rich data within the Sightline products, we will review the competitive trial landscape, trial timings and outcomes, and outcomes, and the investigator and patient trends. The second part will have more of a commercial slant, delving into the IO drug market, um, the non-small cell lung cancer market potential, and where we see the IO market developing within this indication. We'll have some time at the end to wrap up our, conclu our conclusions and take any questions you may have. You'll be able to submit these at any time during the presentation via the question box. And if we don't have time to address them immediately following, then we'll happily spend some time with you afterwards. Okay, so in its most basic sense, IO is a field of medicine that focuses on the development of therapies that improve the, body, the body's ability to generate an immune response against cancer. The general strategy is to counteract some of the mechanisms that the tumor itself uses to suppress the immune system. And while a variety of mechanisms have been investigated with varying degrees of success, there are certain key classes within this IO space that have resulted in approved medicines, as you can see in the list below. These include cancer vaccines, immune <coughs> checkpoint inhibitors, such as CTLA-4 inhibitors and PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors, You've also got bispecific T cell engagers, oncolytic viruses, and lastly, adoptive T cell therapy, the most well known of these being CAR Ts. IO isn't a new concept, but it's only really within the last decade that we've seen some notable successes and then a huge proliferation in R and D interest. It began with the approvals of Provenge for prostate cancer. 
and um, as the first cancer vaccine, and then the CTLA-4 inhibitor Yervoy. And these two drugs, in their own different ways, were the first of their kind to validate that increasing T cell activity can result in a viable oncology drug. This also coincided with the first data, human data, supporting CAR T therapy, uh, which was able to provide complete remission for a pediatric CLL patient, although it wasn't until 2017 when this theory became reality with the first approved drugs. In between these events, the first PD-1 inhibitors became available, which were shortly followed by the PD-L1 inhibitors. Like Yervoy, these act at immune checkpoints, but the mechanism has been shown to be amenable across a wide range of solid tumors. To round off the IO picture, we also have two more singleton drug classes. The bispecific T cell engager Blincito is approved for ALL, while Emlygic is injected into melanoma cells where it replicates, causes lysis, and the release of pro inflammatory cytokines. So now to focus a bit more on the PD1, PDR1 inhibitors, which is a main focus of our presentation. These drugs operate within the PD1 pathway, which acts to downregulate the immune system and suppress T cell activity. Under normal circumstances, this guards against autoimmunity, uh, reduces the immune response after a disease is eliminated, and prevents damage from the inflammatory response. It's hypothesized that cancers can use this mechanism, overexpressing PDL1 thus allowing the tumor to evade the immune system uh, because the host recognizes the tumor cell as itself. The primary difference between PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors is that one blocks from the receptor side and the other blocks from the ligand side. Now, PD-L1 is also expressed on tumor infiltrating immune cells, which include macrophages and dendritic cells. But at this moment in time, there's not necessarily a clear advantage to targeting one portion of the pathway over the other. So now that I've established the backdrop, I'll now hand, hand over to my co-presenter, Andrew, who will walk you through some of the trends we're seeing in clinical developments for IO therapies. Thanks, Dan. So for the following slides, we were discussing the clinical view of immuno-oncology for non-small cell lung cancer. The information used is primarily derived from Informa Pharma Intelligence's sightline suite of products comprising Crowtrove, Cytrove, and Pharma Projects. So firstly, taking a look at the overall clinical trial competitive landscape between 2013 and 2018. And by competitive, I mean trials that are currently planned or active, i.e. those which could be competing for sites, investigators, and of course patients with your own IO trial. In trial troves, these statuses are defined as planned, open, closed, meaning closed to patient recruitment, but the trial is still ongoing and hasn't yet reached its primary endpoints, and temporarily closed. The panel on the left breaks down the number of industry-sponsored IO clinical trials by phase and by status. While there is activity across all phases of development, what stands out is that 87% of the trials are still early stage, i.e. from phase one to phase two. This highlights that the IO NSCLC space is still relatively immature and growing. And in the coming years, provided the various IO strategies play out, we would expect to see a larger number of late stage and hopefully registrational trials becoming activated, all of which will be competing for sites and patients. So future clinical trial design and feasibility approaches will need to be as robust as possible to ensure success in recruitment. Interestingly, we can also see that there are a higher number of hybrid phase one, two trials, including basket studies, than phase two trials. This is opposite to what we see for all NSCLC trials and indeed oncology trials in general over the same period. This shows the increasing importance of these phase one slash two trials in NSCLC IO, where gathering robust data, typically only collected in more traditional phase two and later trials, can potentially lead to an earlier approval for these drugs, and therefore gain a competitive advantage over the other drugs in what will become an increasingly crowded space. The panel on the right of this slide breaks down the top 15 locations being utilized for recruitment in these IO NSCLC trials over this period. Historically, before 2013, this list was dominated by North America and Europe, with just South Korea and Australia the locations outside to feature. As you can see from the top 15 for 2013 to 2018, there has been a shift towards APAC, with, with Japan, South Korea, China, and Taiwan all now being utilized. Overall, 42% of IO NSCLC trials in this period now include locations in APAC, versus just 31% before 2013.
Looking at the same data set from Trial Truth, but now drilling down into the sponsors who are conducting those trials. On the left, in the pie chart, we can see that Bristol Myers Squibb and Merck and Co. account for the biggest slice of the pie. This isn't a surprise when we look at the IO drugs these companies are developing and the total trials they are currently being tested in, as you will see shortly in the next slide. The rest of the top 10 sponsors include Roche, AstraZeneca, Ono Pharmaceutical, Insight, Pfizer, Novartis, Lilly and Celgene. We can see that there is tremendous activity in this NSCLC space amongst top and mid-tier pharma companies with oncology assets. In terms of the overall trial activity in this period, as measured here by trial initiations, the chart on the right is striking in showing the explosive growth in this area as IO has come to the forefront, from just nine NSCLC trials initiated back in 2013 to 146 last year. If we make even a conservative projection for the number of trials we might expect to be initiated for the second half of 2018, there is no reason to expect this year-on-year -year increase to change. Now for a closer look at the specific drugs being used in these competitive trials. This slide and the next show tree maps of the top five approved and top five unapproved IO drugs by total number of trials. The colors indicate the mechanisms of action of those drugs. Firstly, looking at the larger tree map at the top left of this slide, which shows the top five approved IO therapies and trials, we can see that Bristol Myers Squibb and Merck and Co running 90 and 67 trials respectively with their PD-1 antagonists, Opdivo and Keytruda. This accounts for their overall dominance in the NSCLC IO space, as we saw on the previous slide. Roche and AstraZeneca have their PD-L1 antagonists, Tecentric and Infinzi, in 35 and 26 trials respectively. And rounding out the top five is Bristol Myers Squibb CTLA-4 inhibitor, Yervoid, in 22 trials. If we compare this to the top five approved drugs in industry-sponsored planned and open NSCLC trials across all drug types, not just limited to IO, Opdivo and Keytruda would still occupy the top two spots, with just Tegriso, which is an EGFR kinase inhibitor, displacing Yervoid as a non-IO approach. And if we broaden the landscape view even more to just look across all oncology trials, the set of top five drugs is actually identical to this IO set. This really demonstrates how these IO agents are being trialed in a multitude of oncology indications and the potential utility of this approach across a broad swathe of tumor types, not just non-small cell lung cancer. If we now switch to looking at the tree map in the lower right of this slide, which shows the top five unapproved IO drugs in trials, there are actually six drugs listed here as we have ties for first, third, and fifth place. It's interesting to note that four of the drugs all target PD-1, represented in the pink color, with no PD-L1 antagonist represented here at all. The top spot is tied on nine trials each between Novartis' Spartalizumab and Insight's Epicadastat, which is an IDO inhibitor. It's worth noting the recent failure of Epicadastat in a late-stage melanoma trial, which has cast somewhat of a shadow over the future potential of IDO inhibitors, although NSCLC trials are still continuing albeit with a pair of registrational trials downgraded to phase two. We can also see a different approach here in the top five from Nectar Therapeutics with their CD122 biased agonist NKTR214. If we compare the top five unapproved drugs for NSCLC across all drug types, not just IO, we see that the top three drugs remain the same, which is two non-IO approaches entering this group, namely abatinib and clonabulin. However, broadening the top five unapproved drugs to look across all of oncology, not limited to NSCLC, only camrilizumab and spartalizumab remain in the top five as IO drugs. This really demonstrates how current clinical development in NSCLC particularly is heavily focused on IO approaches, but some of the other tumor types have yet to reach the same levels of activity with IO therapy. As we've already seen, there are a large number of trials with IO drugs targeting the PD-1 pathway, either at the receptor or at the ligand level. In total, 83% of ongoing and planned IO NSCLC trials have drugs acting on this pathway. Within the remaining 17% of trials, the list on the left of this slide shows the top mechanisms of action of the drugs being trialed. There are a variety of different approaches, including other IO drugs such as CTLA-4 antagonists and IDO inhibitors as well as targeted agents.
This slide now takes a closer look specifically at the various types of combination treatment regimens that are being evaluated with the five currently approved PD-1 or PD-L1 agents. The IO trials and trial trove have all been tagged by our analysts with the type of combinations being tested, namely combinations with traditional cytotoxic drugs, combinations with non-IO targeted agents, and combinations with other IO agents. It's also worth noting that these are not mutually exclusive, and there are trials with it which are evaluating combinations of more than one type, such as an IO drug in a regimen with both a cytotoxic drug and a targeted agent. Opdivo leads the pack here for total number of combination trials, and also shows a high number of trials evaluating a dual IO regimen. Vivencio is the only drug where the highest concentration of combination trials includes a targeted therapy, this may be driven primarily by the fact that the developers of this drug have collaboration agreements in place to test this agent with targeted therapies, namely Pfizer with Array Biopharma and Merck KGAA with Vaxin, in addition, of course, to combination trials of Pfizer's own internal targeted drugs, such as Zalcori and Talazoparib. For those of you working in setting up clinical trials, perhaps in a feasibility role, or involved in business development or strategic planning, it is important to understand the historical clinical trial timing landscape and also understand which previous trials were successes or failures. How long will it take for you to enroll patients? How long will a trial take to complete? And is my trial design optimized for success? Starting with trial timing, this slide shows a dashboard view of the historical clinical trial timing landscape for industry-sponsored NSCLC studies within IO, created using the Trial Trove API. It allows you to quickly review average enrollment duration, average treatment duration, and average total trial duration. Additionally, the scatter plot view allows you to view any outliers that may have longer enrollment durations but shorter treatment periods, or longer treatment plans and short enrollments. You can quickly click on a dot in the scatter plot to identify a trial of interest to further review the inclusion and exclusion criteria or other protocol elements, for example, to compare to your own study protocols. If you look at the box in the middle of the slide, we can see that the average enrollment duration across this data set was 21.6 months, the average treatment duration was 7.7 .7 months, and the average total trial duration was 29.3 months. Let's now compare these numbers with industry-sponsored NSCLC IO studies conducted more recently and see if the averages have changed. This is now a view of all industry-sponsored NSCLC IO trials initiated since 2013 to date. You will notice that looking across all trials and all phases, the average enrollment duration and total trial duration has dropped. Looking at enrollment durations, we see trials hitting their enrollment targets a full five months earlier, which is a 23% decrease in enrollment time. Meanwhile, average treatment durations have increased slightly. However, if we do look at the same figures broken out by phase of trial, we can see that the reduction in enrollment time has been driven entirely by the earlier phase trials. And in fact, in phase three, average enrollment durations have increased a little whilst treatment durations have decreased. Taking a look now at the outcomes of completed or terminated trials. Although there are a large set of trials in the IO space and NSCLC, which have yet to report clear positive or negative outcomes for their primary endpoints, for those that have, we've listed here a quick summary of the characteristics of those trials. In the purple box are the 23 trials that were successful and met their primary endpoints. Nearly three quarters of these were evaluating IO agents in the second line setting, and 80% were testing already approved drugs. 35% of them were evaluating IO agents in some form of combination regimen. The gray box below it breaks out the characteristics of the nine failed trials which had negative outcomes including four trials which ran to completion and did not meet their primary endpoints, as well as two trials terminated early for safety reasons and three trials terminated early due to a clear lack of efficacy. Finally, the pink box on the right lists those trials that were terminated due to early positive outcomes. These were all phase three registrational or expanded indication trials and represent significant success stories for the drugs and of course for their sponsors. They were the Checkmate 78 trial, sponsored by bristol myers Squibb for Optivo versus chemotherapy in previously treated Chinese patients. The Keynote 189 trial, sponsored by Merck Co., evaluating Keytruda plus chemotherapy in first-line metastatic non-squamous NSCLC. And finally, another Merck Keynote trial, 024, 
evaluating Keytruda versus chemotherapy in patients expressing high levels of PDL1. Closer analysis of the individual trials here, which we do not have time for during this presentation, but which is available in the detailed trial information within Trial Trove, can provide interesting insights into strategies for success. Given the high level of trial activity and the highly competitive nature of the trials in this arena, the demand for patients, sites, and investigators is at a premium. Using Cytrove, we can identify the most qualified investigators to conduct these trials. The investigator landscape for later phase development trials enrolling later stage patients, namely those with stage three or stage four disease, is shown on this slide and was created using the investigator API pulling from Cytrove data. It's showing data for 121 non-small cell lung cancer IO trials. The heat map at the bottom of the slide is showing the concentration of ongoing and planned industry-sponsored NSCRC IO trials globally, allowing you to quickly identify countries with the greatest competition. Additionally, using Cytra's investigator prioritization, which is a proprietary algorithm that ranks investigators based on their trial experience and workload into three tiers, with tier one and tier two representing those investigators with the highest probability to perform well compared to tier three, We've been able to identify tier one and tier two investigators with the greatest experience conducting IO and SCLC industry-sponsored trials and who are not currently involved in a competitive study as per publicly available sources. There are a total of 520 investigators with the tier one investigators shown in yellow and the tier two investigators in pink. This allows you to quickly identify those countries with the least competitive trial activity, but with the greatest number of experienced investigators which provides a directional approach for which countries you may want to run your study in. We are also able to identify the top 10 Tier 1 NSCLC IO investigators based on the number of trials they have conducted matching our search and the greatest experience, found in the chart in the upper right-hand corner, and using our site trove investigator API and the publicly available PubMed API, we can identify the number of NSCLC publications for each investigator. This is an additional data element that might be important to you when identifying investigators or potentially key opinion leaders for your own study. So once the top investigators are identified, how do we then identify the patients matching our study protocol? Earlier this year, we signed a partnership with Trinetics, which has a global health network patient data set, including diagnoses, procedures, medications, demographics, and more. We use Trinetics data to identify patients who have advanced non-small cell lung cancer and are PD-1 and PD-L1 naive. As we added in our inclusion and exclusion criteria, we identified 3,170 patients in the US across 10 healthcare organizations that fall within Trinetics current coverage. From here, we took our set of tier one and tier two US investigators who have experience in industry-sponsored NSCLC IO trials and identified which investigators are located at the same organization as each cohort of patients. There were a total of 61 experienced investigators across the same 10 healthcare organizations who are not currently engaged in a competitive study. The heat map on this slide depicts the number of patients at the state level, which easily shows that Wisconsin has the greatest number of patients matching our protocol. Additionally, the size of the dots represent the number of experienced investigators and when yellow, it means that at least one tier one investigator is located at that particular site. While Cornell in New York has the greatest number of experienced investigators with 110 patients located at the same facility. Therefore, by using our investigator and trials APIs to map these data with third party patient data from Trinetics, we are able to provide a more targeted approach for site selection by identifying the most experienced investigators who have access to the greatest number of patients matching our protocols criteria. I'm now gonna hand back over to my colleague, Dan, who will take us on a deeper dive into the commercial considerations of the IO NSCLC space. Thank you very much. So my, my first slide here uh, shows a heat map of the approved and late stage PD-1, PD-L1 candidates and then the indications that they are either approved for or being developed for. It's quite um, an information-rich slide, um, so perhaps useful more as a reference, but there are some interesting trends that emerge from this and are definitely worth some more discussion. So on the most basic level, bladder cancer is the top most indication, 
and this shows that it leads the way with approval to all five of the currently marketed drugs. Non-small cell lung cancer is also a hugely important indication with four currently approved treatments. The vast majority of indications here are the traditional solid tumor indications. This is where the PD-1s have been most successful rather than in blood cancers, although Hodgkin's lymphoma is a notable exception. The last comment I would make about indications is that we performed this analysis a year ago, and upon doing it again for this presentation, the number of active indications in this list has grown by 10, and clinical investigations now span a total of 35 different indications for this drug class. Now, looking at it on a drug-by-drug -drug basis, the first-to-market drugs, Opdivo and Keytruda, still lead the pack in terms of the breadth of their approved settings. Bristol-Myers, Squibb and Merck have supported these drugs with considerable additional investment beyond simply getting them to market originally. This has forced newer entrants um, into this landscape to target particular patient niches, either within the large indications or rare indications altogether. One example being Bevencio being approved for Merkel cell carcinoma. And then if you look at Simiplumab's development program, Regeneron is targeting squamous cell carcinoma as its primary indication. Now, the graphic here is a comparison of the PD-1, PD-L1 class against the other most common IO drug classes. And we're looking at the successful transitions between clinical phases. There's a few acronyms that I'll just run through. POS stands for the probability of success, which is the successful completion of a clinical stage, while LOA is the likelihood of approval for a given asset in that stage of development. To the right-hand side, you can see the development timeline benchmarks based on the time spent to each phase before transition to the next, and then the total number of transitions logged in the Pharma Premia database against each of these categories. The main takeaway is that success rates for PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors in oncology have been much higher than the other main IO drug classes. Across our data set, we've only picked up six confirmed suspensions out of a total of 132 transitions, and no single PD-1 program has been suspended once it's reached either phase three or the BLA stage. Now, if you contrast this with the CTLA-4 inhibitor class, there has just been a single approval in a single indication with a further 17 confirmed suspensions. The CAR-T story is still very young, um, and the data is skewed somewhat by an absence of phase two studies, but the early signs are very promising. Um, so the data show on average, um, a PD-1 program takes five and a half years from the initiation of phase one clinical trials to the successful approval. This compares to a benchmark of 9.1 years for the total oncology filter and 9.2 years for the entire Pharma Premier data set. And this is relatively closely aligned with that commonly cited 10-year time frame for clinical trials. Okay, so now focusing specifically on the PD-1, PD-L1 class and then non-small cell lung cancer, this graph here has stacked up the timelines of each drug um, that has a successful phase transition. As the first drug to be evaluated, Opdivo has comfortably the longest development timeline. Um, you can see a very lengthy stay in phase one before an accelerated progression towards the market. Now, partly owing to the precedent that Opdivo established, subsequent PD-1, PD-R1 inhibitors reach the market in a much shorter time. Developers have also been motivated by the advantage of reaching the market earlier, ahead of potential competition. You'll also note from the previous clinical slides that show that the trend, there's a trend for decreasing enrollment times in recent years. Now, specific, specifically within non-small cell lung cancer, no single drug has failed a phase transition yet, although there have been notable trial failures, and I'll go into uh, detail here more later on. And as is typical with oncology, you can skip phases. The phase one to phase three transition is a common one. This is the result of these phase, <clears throat> phase one slash two hybrid basket studies, and they can generate sufficient data to identify the appropriate patients and inform the design for registrational trials, therefore bypassing the need for a phase two study. Of the four drugs that have now gained approval in non-small cell lung cancer, 
The time, total time spent in phase two is just over two years, and the average review period lasts approximately eight months. But I'd now like to switch the focus to the non-small cell uh, lung cancer market landscape so we can assess the opportunity for IO therapies in this space. This indication alone could account for up to half of all sales of PD-1 inhibitors, so it's highly important and worth delving into more deeply. As you may know, lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer deaths worldwide, and non-small cell lung cancer accounts for around 85% of lung cancers. Now, beginning with the patient potential, we estimate that there are just over half a million incident cases of non-small cell lung cancer each year in the US, Japan, and the five major EU markets. This number is, is expected to increase over the next 20 years, predominantly in line with population aging, and also factoring in changes in smoking patterns. Unlike most other solid tumors, the largest number of diagnoses for non-small cell lung cancer are made when the cancer is late stage, and particularly at stage four, where treatment is predominantly palliative. This is because the earlier stages are often asymptomatic, and even when these symptoms do present, they can be largely nonspecific. Now, further compounding this situation, there are no universally accepted screening programs for lung cancer, although this is an area of active investigation. Combining the incident estimates with survival outcomes, Data Monster Healthcare estimates that there are over 700,000 prevalent cases of non-small cell lung cancer at any one time. Okay, now looking more closely at the segmentation of the non-small cell lung cancer patient population, this slide contains a cross-sectional view of the relevant patient groups, and this is according to primary research conducted with oncologists. So if we consider the 700,000 or so prevalent cases, a certain proportion of these are at any one time are being actively treated, and these can, can then be divided among the varying tumor classification stages as shown here, from stages one to four, also including those that have suffered either a local or a distant relapse. Now, focusing on the highly important stage four group, which is the target market for pharmaceuticals, it's essential to identify the tumor histology, so whether that's a non-squamous or a squamous, um, and the presence of certain mutations. So these segments guide the selection of the appropriate treatment, as the next slide will show. You'll see here that non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer is the most common type, and these patients have a high likelihood of having a single driving mutation. So among these, the EGFR mutation is common, more so than ALK rearrangements while there are a number of other mutations for which there aren't yet specific targeted therapies. Within each of these patient segments, you can also go to the next level, which is the line of therapy level. And this directs whether patients are either newly diagnosed or whether they've been previously treated. And just to conclude, the first line treatment for non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer is the largest patient group to target. Okay, this next slide is a visual representation of the current competitive landscape uh, for non-small cell lung cancer therapies in the US. It shows current approvals in dark blue, um, label expansions of these currently approved therapies in the green, pipeline therapies in yellow, and then areas of off-label use in the lighter blue. So it's quite a rich slide, there's a lot of information, um, but my reason for including it is it really shows nicely um, that you can appreciate that the treatment algorithm is very deep and also segmented. You have a, a large number of different treatment options for each patient group, and these span various drug classes, which include chemotherapy options, targeted therapies, IO therapies, and then also combinations of these. So the number of green and yellow bars bears testament to the amount of active research going on in this area we would expect a number of additional approvals to further expand the number of uh, treatment options available to patients. If you look at this graphic column by column, you can also appreciate how important tumor histology is for the choice of therapy, and also being able to identify the appropriate um, addressable EGFR and ALK mutations. 
increasingly now, PDL1 expression levels are also factoring in when it comes to selecting the appropriate checkpoint inhibitor. Lastly, you'll notice that um, among these PD1s, there are important differences in the target populations. The majority of the uptake of these PD1, PDL1 inhibitors will occur in the right hand side of this image, as those with these addressable um, single mutations are likely to initiate therapy with a, a targeted drug. Let's now focus in on some of the specifics within this PD1, PDL1 class so we can begin to understand each drug's positioning and commercial prospects. As the first drug to market, Opdivo held a huge advantage and it's accrued a large amount of physician familiarity, both within and outside of non-small cell lung cancer. Its approval of the monotherapy um, in previously treated patients uh, is irrespective of PDL1 expression levels, which enables it to be prescribed without PDL1 testing, an advantage for practicality and cost reasons. However, counting against it, it importantly failed the Checkmate 026 trial, which was designed to expand its use to that first line newly diagnosed setting. Bristol Myers Squibb is still trying to position Optivo as a first line drug, and it's doing this via the combination with Yervoy among patients with a high tumor mutational burden. More on this to come later. Now, Keytruda launched after Optivo, and initially it struggled competitively. Patients were required to have a certain threshold of pd one expression in order to be eligible for treatment. However, the dynamic between Optivo and Keytruda changed completely. This is um, when Optivo failed its first line study, but Keytruda achieved multiple successes in this setting. Keytruda is now approved as a, um, at first line as both a monotherapy and in combination with Elimta based chemotherapies. And it's this combination with Elimta that's where it's redefining the standard of care. Merck is now also continuing to expand its target market through additional patient groups and then also lowering the PDL1 expression levels required for patients to be eligible to, for treatment. Decentric was the first checkpoint inhibitor to get approved that targets PDL1, um, which provides some differ differentiation, although in terms of its product label, it's yet to really um, separate from Opdivo and Yervoy, and this is its biggest weakness. It does have some similarities to Opdivo in that it's approved for all previously treated patients and it doesn't require PDL1 testing. And Roche has recently completed a number of um, positive phase three trials that should greatly expand its role, including providing access to newly diagnosed first line patients. However, at this first line setting, it may still trail Keytruda based regimens. Uh, lastly, um, Tocentric has also become the first drug to generate overall survival data in small cell lung cancer. And it's well positioned with Roche's expertise in oncology and future IO drug combinations. Now, Infinity is the latest entrance to the market, and you could argue that it's yet to really make its mark. It's had multiple setbacks in clinical trials across first, second, and third line settings, although it is uniquely approved as an adjuvant following chemotherapy in unresectable stage three patients. In this patient pool, which is, a, is quite small, it does have a notable head start on its rivals. And AstraZeneca is continuing to expand or to attempt to expand Infinity's product label to provide access to those important stage four patients. Okay, so I'm now presenting our projections for the NFCLC market in the US, Japan, and five major EU markets. In total, the major branded therapies were worth $11.3 billion in 2017, and this market is expected to grow at a double-digit pace for the next 10 years to over $33 billion by 2026. Now, this huge increase is driven by numerous factors, including um, increased disease prevalence, new targeted therapies for patients that require resistance to tyrosine kinase inhibitors, but also importantly, it's due to the uptake of these expensive PD-1, PD-L1 therapies. Now, this drug class was already the highest value in 2017, when sales totaled $3.6 billion. And this class is expected to grow to over $17 billion in non-small cell lung cancer alone. By 2026, the class will be worth over half of the overall market value. 
Now, these sales will be shared not only among the four currently approved drugs that we've just gone into detail, um, but also among two new market entrants, Bevencio and Simiplumab, which will expand the number of available treatment options. It's also worth noting that there is further upside potential to this forecast should some of the earlier clinical research into new IO combinations and patient groups prove successful. Now, within the class, Keytruda is overtaking Opdivo to become the highest selling drug. So Opdivo's surprising failure at first line afforded Keytruda with this huge opportunity, which it was able to take with the positive data as a monotherapy and in combination with chemotherapy across non squamous patients. Keytruda will enjoy being the only approved drug in the setting until later this year, uh, when we expect the Centrix to gain that important first line approval. Optivo will finally catch up with this year by combination in patients with high TMB next year. So Optivo will remain um, a leading choice for previously treated patients. It has this broad label here that spans PDL1 expression levels. Um, although Tocentric will be competing with Optivo for um, previously treated patients, Optivo is already entrenched and has high physician familiarity. And this is supported by its long-standing use in non-small cell lung cancer and approvals across a wide range of um, other oncology settings too. Now with further label expansions and testing in combinations supported by this TMB biomarker, um, Bristol Myers Squibb should be able to grow the patient population for Optivo and reach over $4 billion in annual sales. Both Tocentric and Infinzi will be attempting to catch up to the market leading positions of Optivo and Keytruda, and they will still accrue considerable sales despite reaching the market later. Roche has a robust development program planned for Tocentric in non small cell lung cancer, and this includes a variety of tar different target populations and drug combinations. AstraZeneca already has this adjuvant approval for Infinzi, as we've just discussed and it will be able to support further expansion into the um, stage four patients with its own IO-IO combination involving tremulimumab. Okay, I'd now like to talk through some of the challenges that face the PD-1 class as it matures and how companies should best position themselves to adapt. Now, the first point I'd like to make is that we have overall survival data for multiple products across a range of settings. Over the past few years, the PD-1 class has been able to address a lot of the unmet clinical needs in NSCLC and raise the bar such that new market entrants in the class may find it difficult to compete, even with overall survival data of their own. With four approved PD-1s and a further two expected in the not so distant future, the market dynamic is rapidly maturing and a more congested treatment landscape won't necessarily help the market to grow. Um, no group as yet is attempting to clearly define the superior drug in the class via head-to-head -head comparisons. All of this contributes to the perception that these drugs are not at all differentiated in terms of their being a monotherapy. It can then fall to combination strategies for these products to really diverge, and this is where the drug developers can heavily influence the winning strategy. So in terms of NSCRC, there are realistically three main drug classes with which to combine a PD-1 backbone. This is chemotherapy, targeted agents, and other IO therapies. Chemotherapy is already a mainstay treatment for non-small cell lung cancer, and the combination with PD-1 is becoming the new standard of care. The specific chemotherapy backbone is still critical. Part of the reason why the Keytruda and Olympta-based chemotherapy data are being spoken of so highly is because Olympta plus chemotherapy was already the standard of care. And although Tocentric has positive data in combination with Abraxane now, this trial is unlikely to change the landscape as much, as Abraxane is not as widely, as widely used at first line. So another combination that's currently more prevalent outside of non-small cell lung cancer, but we expect to see featuring more heavily in future trials, is this combination of PD-1s and targeted therapies whether that's in the form of an angiogenesis inhibitor such as Avastin or tyrosine kinase inhibitors for these specific non-squamous mutations. This may allow the PD-1 class to further penetrate the first line market, although it does begin to introduce cost pressures that I'll go into detail later on. 
Lastly, we have the IO IO combinations with the Opdivo plus Yervoy example expected to gain first line approval next year. IO combinations are attractive because they have the potential for high efficacy without the burden of chemotherapy. Thus far, the combination with CTLA4 inhibitors um, such as Yervoy still has this considerable toxicity and other classes being investigated such as the IDO inhibitors have been unsuccessful. An interesting analog is this Opdivo plus Yervoy combination in melanoma that's already approved. Now this combination was significantly better than the two monotherapies, although it comes at the expense of a threefold increase in grade three or four toxicities and a list price that exceeds $200,000 per patient. This leads us, leads us into the stacked biologics problem, which was initially coined by Roche. It's unsustainable for these combinations to be priced at the level of their constituent monotherapies. So manufacturers will need to em employ indication specific pricing for their drugs rather than a single list price. Alternatively, with this Opdivo Yervoy melanoma example, Bristol Myers Squibb is able to greatly reduce the cost of the Yervoy component, even giving it away for free in order to facilitate access. Although this provides a large hurdle to overcome when the biologics combination involves two different manufacturers, so you're not at liberty to greatly reduce the cost of one component. Another challenge for drug developers is the use of PDL1 as a biomarker. It's initially hypothesized that PDL1 expression might be an indicator of response to PD1 inhibitors. This is because the PD1 PDL1 interaction downregulates the immune response, as we discussed earlier. Now, a correlation has been observed, but the results are somewhat inconsistent. We've seen benefits for both PDL1 positive and negative tumors, and in some cases, a complete response cannot be excluded for low or negative tumors. In addition, PDL1 expression is dynamic. So it's expressed on multiple cell types and varies based on the disease site and the time of measurement. PDL1 expression is not binary. It occurs on a sliding scale, and the cutoff at which a test is considered positive, which is anywhere from 1% to 50%, is arbitrary. Furthermore, a patient can test differently depending on the exact assay that is used, and each approved PD-1 drug has its own accompanying assay. This leads us into a discussion about this Blueprint PD-L1 assay comparison project. Looking first at the top right graph, which shows tumor cell staining, you will see that three of the assays were relatively well aligned, whereas the tissentric assay in the lighter blue consistently reported lower scores. Below this, we can see the consensus areas for the four assays in terms of positive tests. Among a group of 38 patients that were evaluated, uh, the test for Tocentric gave 30 positive scores, which was four more than those for Keytruda and Optivo, and 10 more positive tests than that from Finzi. A total of 19 patients were classified as PDL1 positive by all of the tests, while five had consistently negative scores. This therefore leaves 14 out of the total 38 with discordant results. This is approximately 40% of the total sample. Now this is important because if PDL1 expression is going to be used to select the appropriate patients for treatment, then consistent and accurate testing would be beneficial. Until a common standard is established, measuring PDL1 expression reliably is going to be a challenge. We've briefly touched upon TMB as a potential biomarker in addition to PDL1 um, that can be used to stratify patients. But what is it? TMB quantitatively describes the total number of mutations per coding area of a tumor gene. A higher TMB means that, tu that the tumor is expressing more neoantigens and is therefore more likely to be amenable to immunotherapy. There is a lot of work going into this at the moment. And if trials continue to validate TMB levels with PD-1 inhibitor response, then it may become part of the standard diagnostic workup. Bristol Myers Squibb is one of the leaders driving this, partly owing to its development strategy with Opdivo. One of the triggers was the failure of Bristol Myers Squibb's Checkmate 026 study, which, as you may recall, failed to show a benefit for PD-1 monotherapy at first line on small cell lung cancer. But when the results were poured over, it was discovered in post hoc analyses that a patient's TMB strongly correlated to the treatment response. 
So this finding was subsequently tested in Bristol Myers Squibb's Checkmate 227 study, which was the one that's evaluating Optivo and Yervoy at first line. The protocol was adjusted after the trial started in order to perform the efficacy analysis according to TMV segmentation. And it was demonstrated that those with high TMV had significantly improved progression-free survival compared to chemotherapy alone. This efficacy was demonstrated across all PD-L1 expression levels. Now, a supplemental NDA with this data is under regulatory review, and Bristol Myers Squibb's hopes that its approval would lead to TMB joining the panel of biomarkers that are routinely tested upon diagnosis. Now, the sentiment at the recent ASCO is that there's not yet enough data supporting TMB, so it may take some time before Bristol Myers Squibb is able to effectively compete at first line although there is a lot of additional validation work going on. There are a total of 176 active trials incorporating TMB in the trial trove database, and these include a wide range of industry sponsors, primary drug candidates, and tumor locations. This is certainly an evolving area and one paying, uh, worth paying close attention to. So cancers are still predominantly treated based on tumor location. You could use this statement to make a case to say that the research into genetics and molecular oncology that started in the 1980s has yet to really fulfill its potential. There have been huge advances in discovering new targets and segmenting patient populations, although it hasn't been until the first checkpoint inhibitors were developed that a truly tissue agnostic approach has been validated. The first approval was that for Keytruda in May last year when it was licensed to treat all microsatellite instability high MSH, MSIH tumors, irrespective of their location. And this was instigated by a group at Johns Hopkins University who hypothesized that because tumors with DNA mismatch repair defects produce large numbers of new antigens, these cancers should be particularly sensitive to immune checkpoint inhibitors and a T cell response. This theory was tested when an 86 patient trial of Keytruda in patients with MSIH as a hypermutation marker yielded an overall response rate of over 50%. The Kaplan-Meier estimates for PFS and OS are shown on the slide here, as well as the patient spread by tumor location and effect on tumor size. Merck's subsequently conducted its own larger scale trials and the FDA's accelerated approval of Keytruda in this setting followed. Now the incidence of cancers with DNA mismatch repair defects is estimated to be 40,000 patients every year for stages one to three, and a further 20,000 patients at stage four. So even this one small example has large commercial ramifications. So how will this new dynamic emerge over the next few years? Most immediately, we would expect further PD-1 data in this patient, particular patient group, and then a competitive dynamic between the classes to develop. It's possible that the PD-1 class is also amenable for other specific mutations that span a range of tumors. This may come out with wider use of the TMB biomarker and the large amount of patient data being generated. Furthermore, this tissue agnostic approach isn't just relevant for IOs, but there are also a variety of other kinase inhibitors that are being tested for rare gene fusions that may work uniformly across tissue types. The next approval is likely to be larotrectinib a TRK inhibitor that was developed from the outset in a tissue agnostic manner. To round off today's presentation, uh, we've taken a look at the Biometracker Catalyst database and honed in on the high impact catalysts that we expect over the next 18 months, and then the dynamics also included in Data Models for Healthcare's forecast. So there will be a good amount of pivotal data for all of the PD-1 class, particularly surrounding these drugs used at first line therapy. So as the graphic here shows, all four of the drugs within the class will successfully expand to the first line setting, and they will also all gain approval for use in combination with either a chemotherapy or alongside a CTLA4 inhibitor. This will certainly blunt some of the competitive advantage that Keytruda currently has, although we do still expect the Keytruda Olympta chemotherapy regimen to remain a standard of care. It's going to be interesting to see how the formal approval of Keytruda and Optivo in patients with high TMB affects uptake of the biomarker, although we expect it won't be until there's really competitive data in non-small cell lung cancer and other indications that TMB testing will become routine. One particular program that we're looking at next involves the B-first and B-fast trials, and these involve T-centric 
and a blood-based next-generation sequencing assays for TMB. Also of interest, there are three separate programs for IO-IO combinations, specifically involving cancer vaccines. While these vaccines are yet to produce compelling data as monotherapies, their use alongside PD-1 therapies may provide additional benefits. They're designed to work by stimulating the overexpression of tumor-specific antigens, which are in turn recognized by the T-cell response. The particular programs belong to the companies Transgene, Bavarian Nordic, and Asterius, which may well be names to look out for in the near term. And so to conclude our presentation on IO in non-small cell lung cancer, we'll just review the main takeaways. IO therapies work by stimulating the innate immune system to act against tumor cells. This can be achieved with a variety of different mechanisms. Thus far, PD-1 has been the most successful and they account for five out of the nine approved IO therapies. Bristol Myers Squibb and Merck are the leading sponsors of clinical trials, which follows being the first to market with their products Optivo and Keytruda. These IO trials are typically weighted toward the earlier stage phase one slash two basket studies, more so than for traditional oncology drugs, and the average enrollment durations are coming down. As more and more studies are being conducted, it's important to be able to use all the available data sources to identify the appropriate investigators and locations in order to position trials for the highest likelihood of success. The PD-1 class is being investigated across a wide range of indications with a predominant focus on solid tumors, and they're outperforming other drug classes in terms of clinical development benchmarks. Now, specifically with a non-small cell lung cancer, which is the largest commercial opportunity for PD-1s, IO is now established as a standard treatment at second line, and recent expansions are now providing access to this hugely lucrative first line market. The individual PD-1s do have slightly differentiated product labels, although they're generally perceived to be similar. Together, their sales will grow from $3.6 billion to $17.7 billion by 2026. By this time, they'll account for over half of the total market value. Choosing the right combination strategy will provide clear product differentiation and likely decide the future market leaders. And tumor mutational burden and tissue agnostic drug development are both emerging themes that are highly relevant for IO drug classes and worth staying abreast of. We hope you've enjoyed our presentation on the landscape of IO um, in non-small cell lung cancer, and we would encourage you to submit any final questions. We'll take as many now as time allows and follow up if there are any other additional questions. And there's also an abundance of additional resources available for you within Informer's Pharma Intelligence portfolio. So please do let us know if you'd like to find out more. Thank you very much. So thanks, Dan. Um, we do have a number of questions uh, that have come in, and uh, I'm just going to take a couple really quickly now. So the first question was asking about uh, average trial durations, uh, and it's asking that, well, let me show that average trial durations um, were decreasing, particularly driven by shorter enrollment durations. Um, we also talked about the competition, competition for patients increasing um, due to the amount of activity in the space. Uh, so the question was really, what, would, what was the reason for this? Um, and I think it really speaks to sponsors increasingly looking to wider geographies to find their patients. Uh, for example, the expansion into APAC that we showed in, um, in one of the slides earlier. Uh, also the use of a robust data-driven approach to feasibility and recruitment uh, using external data where available, which really allows sponsors to target the right location sites and investigators. Uh, historically, many sponsors would um, have their own set of trusted sites and investigators that they would return to again and again and they were familiar with, but they often wouldn't have any external validation of uh, where these ranked overall. Um, so by using services like um, Sightline married with other data sources, such as the patient data from Trinetics, it, it really enables sponsors to be much more selective and also access a greater pool of potentially high-performing sites and investigators. And we had another question here um, that was specifically about what's happening in China. So um, whether there was any um, homegrown or indigenous Chinese um, NSCLC IO clinical development happening. Uh, and the answer is yes, there is absolutely activity here. 
Um, in fact, uh, camrelizumab, which we saw on the tree map slide of the top five unapproved iotherapies in competitive trials, um, is being developed by Jiangsu Hunrei Medicine and is currently in trials in China and Australia. Um, but there's other um, development happening as well. Um, Seastone Pharmaceuticals, Persingen Biomedicine, and Shanghai Ho Chao Pai Technology have IO therapies in the clinic. Um, so we're definitely seeing um, novel IO therapies coming out of China, um, entering the clinic, and we would, of course, expect to see the amount of these increase over time. Hi, Andy. I think we've just come on for the full hour. I know there have been additional questions that have been submitted, so we will be following up with you um, personally, um, perhaps over email. So, yeah, please do keep the questions coming in either now or submitting them to Annie, and we'll get back in touch with you. But just to say thank you again, we really appreciate you attending our session, and um, enjoy the rest of your day.